Let's get started, though. We have a couple of announcements that I want to just bring you and kind of keep you updated on some of the things that are happening here at the church. Again, there's, uh, there's a more extended announcement that you can get through email. If you're not signed up for our email list yet, please talk to me or talk to Becky here as well at, on, on the keyboard. She'll be happy to add you to the email list and get the detailed version. This is kind of more the condensed down version. Um, but first of all, there's going to be decorating right after service today for Christmas. And so if you're in the Christmas spirit already, or if you're not, but you want to get into the Christmas spirit, stay afterwards with us and help us get decorated. It doesn't take too long um, if we have a lot of help, hands helping out. Secondly, we have uh, so our Sunday night Bible study that typically takes place at me and Stephanie's house is going to be canceled for tonight, um, in part due to the fact that I'm traveling up north um, this afternoon to go to Word of Life. Uh, Bible Institute to do some teaching uh, over the course of the next week. And so I'll be teaching through First Peter uh, with the, the students up there. And so tonight our Bible study is canceled. Uh, but I just remind you of Matt and Kellyanne Bible study if you want to talk to them about it. Um, also, Carl and Mary Wilson are starting a new Bible study tonight um, for the first time. And so uh, you could talk to Carl's here this morning if you want to talk to him. Um, but the Bible study they're doing is called Where Do We Go From Here? And it utilizes some of the teaching through the DVDs, uh, through video uh, lessons of uh, Dr. Jer David Jeremiah. So if you're interested in checking that out, please talk to him um, and head out to his place right here in Waterford, 6.30 tonight. Um, thirdly, we have a, a care team meeting happening Friday, December the 2nd, 7 o'clock uh, at me and Stephanie's house. Now, if you've never been part of the care team before and you maybe want to come out for the first time and check it out, please do that. If, even if you're just kind of feeling it out to see if it's something you want to be part of, um, no strings attached, no commitment necessary, just come out and see what we're about. And if you want to keep being part of the committee, then yeah, you're, you're more than welcome to. Uh, we, are, we are looking for a couple extra volunteers to help out. It makes our planning and executing of the different ministries we have um, much easier if we have a couple more helpers. So if you want to take part in that, December 2nd, um, 7 o'clock at me and Stephanie's place. Uh, fourthly, just very quickly, we're going to have Dan Johnson visiting next week. He's going to give a quick report on what they're doing out in Port Dover for the church plant that's happening there, which we're supporting. And so I just want to let you know that, um, just in case you're thinking of skipping church next Sunday, I don't know if you, if you plan those things or not, but now Dan's going to be here next week. And so if you really you know, want to get a good update on what's going on out in Port Dover, come and check it out, see what he has to say. And then we're just going to have a special time of prayer over him. And we're going to invite any of his team who are coming to visit as well up to the front and the leaders will just have a time of prayer over them and what they're doing out in Port Dover. Uh, lastly, we're going to be taking up a special love offering this morning. Now, this is kind of in addition to, over and above, our typical offerings. So the typical offering, of course, if you're still interested in just giving to the church, um, please do that through the offering box up here at the front or through our e-transfer option, churchwaterford at gmail.com. You can, you can e-transfer that way. Uh, but our special love offering is, is going to take place later in the service, after the singing, uh, after the third song we sing, we're going to take up a love offering, and we're going to pass the plates around. For the first time in like three years or so, we're going to pass the plates around, and we're going to take up a love offering. And what that love offering is for, it's a special one-time donation that we as a church are going to be giving to the missionary family that John Goodlett mentioned uh, last week, uh, the Mackey family, or Mackey's family, as they're serving out in the Philippines. And um, so hopefully you were able to be here for that last week, just to give the quick report on that. But there was severe flooding that went through the Philippines uh, about a month ago, and their family was hit hard by it, lost a lot of their goods and dam uh, damaged goods through that flood. And so what we're seeking to do is just have a special love offering today, uh, collect those funds, and then WCC will send them off uh, to Extreme Response, which is the mission agency that works or, or that uh, Mackie works with. And so this morning, if you came prepared, we're going to ask that you might give through check or cash. Those are the ways we'd ask you to give. And if you're giving by check, just make it out to Waterford Community Church. We're going to collect this separately, count it separately, and then send it off 
to ER afterwards from, from WCC, okay? So that's a little bit about that. Some of you asked me, what, what do you make the check out to? Make the check out to Waterford Community Church still, and then that way you'll still get tax receipts and all that kind of thing. If you gave cash or you're going to give cash and you'd like a tax receipt for it, please just include maybe a slip of paper with it saying your, your contact information. That way we'll be able to, again, add that to your tax receipt at the end of the year. All right, hopefully that kind of covers the details and the basis for this morning. Uh, but with all that in mind, we're going to pause now and just go to the Lord in prayer as we open up our worship service to Him. So if you're able, please stand with me today and we'll go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we prepare our hearts before you this morning, we pray that your presence would be felt and known. Help us to know, Father, that what we do here today, it's a supernatural act. It's not to be trivialized or taken for granted. It is not simply routine or ritual. It's an act of coming into your presence, experiencing the very living God. So help us this morning, Father, to be aware of your presence, to be offering up to you through the songs and through the word, spiritual acts of worship, Lord, that you would be pleased with. And so we pray that you'd be glorified and honored today through this service to you, the worship service that we give. And Lord, again, we would also pray that you would bless us. Bless us, Father, through your word. Help us to see you clearly, to be convicted, to live for you. And we pray that we would honor you with our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. In the bleak midwinter, all creation groans for a world in darkness frozen like a stone light is breaking in a stable for a throne and he shall reign forevermore forevermore and he shall reign forevermore forevermore Unto us a child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. If I were a wise man, I would travel far, and if I were a shepherd, I would do my part, for as I am, I will give to him my heart, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Here within the manger lies the one who made the starry skies, this baby born for sacrifice, Christ the Messiah. Into our hopes, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears, the promise of eternal years, Christ the Messiah, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and He shall reign forevermore. Forevermore, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, Well, good morning, church family. Trust that sets your mind on the Lord this morning, that he shall reign forevermore. And that's the reason why we gathered this morning, that we would praise him and praise his name, because he is the only one who is worthy 
of all glory. We're going to introduce a new song for you. Now, before that scares you, it's okay. It's not actually a new song for the global church. It may be just a new one for us. It's one that I haven't played here before. It's a song called, Oh, Praise the Name. And then before the message this morning, we're going to sing Calvary Covers It All with a desire this morning that we were set our hearts and our minds on the reason why Christ came. He came to die, to pay the price for our sin, to give us life and life eternal. We can celebrate in that this morning. So let's sing together, Oh, Praise the Name. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. sun shall pierce a night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise him name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise O Lord O Lord our God O praise the name of the Lord our God O praise his name forever
world could impart was the message that came to my heart. How the Jesus alone for my sin did I. time, I'm going to ask if uh, a few of our men could come forward. We're going to take up offering. And again, just uh, like to remind you, this is a special love offering. So if God's put on your heart that you would like to help this family, and I realize that for probably the vast majority of us, we don't know who this, this family even is. They're thousands of miles overseas, and they're in a very difficult spot right now. And again, <laughs> Uh, the report that was given was, of course, that they're in great need for many of the belongings that have been damaged. And so if, if you would like to give to that cause this morning, if you feel God leading you to give to that cause, we would uh, encourage you to do so. And so, uh, again, we'll bow in a word of prayer and commit this to him, and then we'll have the men go and take up. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we do want to pray for Mackie and his family that most importantly, Lord, you would give them safety and peace. Father, encourage them to continue in the ministry that you have um, began in them, that they would see people come to know you through the proclamation of your gospel in the Philippines. And Father, I pray that through um, giving like this morning, and perhaps even through other churches overseas, they would be blessed, that you would bless them that this token, Lord, would be given to them in a way to help them meet their real needs, but that it would also be used to encourage their hearts that they are part of the church and that you, Father, are indeed uh, encouraging them to continue on and to strive on for the prize. So, Father, move in our hearts this morning. We pray that this would be used for your glory and honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I want to say thank you to the church family, of course, for being able to answer the call and be able to help this family overseas. Uh, it is a wonderful joy to be able to, to participate in God's global kingdom and to help in this way. And uh, we'll be, I'll be looking forward to hear from John for how Mackie kind of makes out in the coming weeks and we'll report back to you on what his family's up to and how they're doing, okay? Um, but now we are going to uh, look at the kids' video and then afterwards the kids will be dismissed for junior church. So, well, take a look at that up on the screen. Job was a wealthy man who loved God and wanted to follow God's plan. Job was honest. He feared God and turned away from evil. One day, God's enemy, Satan, went to God. God told Satan, no one else on earth is like Job. Job only follows you because you protect him and bless him, Satan said. If you take away everything Job has, he won't follow you anymore. So God gave Satan permission to take away everything Job had, but Satan was not allowed to hurt Job. Satan sent men to steal Job's animals. He caused Job's children to die. In one day, Job lost everything. Job was very sad, but he still followed God. Satan came to God again. He said, if Job gets sick, he will not praise you anymore. So. God gave Satan permission to make Job sick, but God did not let Satan kill Job. Satan covered Job's skin with painful sores. Do you still have faith in God? Job's wife asked. Curse God and die. That's foolish, Job said. How can we accept good things from God and not trouble? <laughs> then three of Job's friends visited Job. Their names were Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They said, Job, if you do what is right and stop sinning, God will give you back everything you lost. I haven't done anything wrong, Job said. Job wished he had someone to talk to God for him. He wanted answers. He didn't understand why he was suffering. Had God made a mistake? Then a man named Elihu came to Job. God is greater than man, Elihu explained. God always does what is right. Finally, God spoke to Job through a whirlwind. Were you there when I made the earth? God asked. Are you the one who told the sea where to stop? Did you decide when the sun would rise or when snow would fall? Did you put stars in the sky? Can you tell the eagles when to fly in the sky? Job could not completely understand God's plans, but he could trust God. God is all powerful, sovereign, and good. Job was sorry for doubting God. God gave Job back everything that he'd lost and so much more. Job learned that God is all powerful, sovereign, and good. When we face suffering, we can hope in God. God sent Jesus, the only truly innocent one, to suffer and die so that everyone who trusts in him can have forgiveness and eternal life. And uh, we're going to get into God's Word for the message this morning. And before we do, though, let's just bow in a word of prayer and we'll commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us in understanding your Word this morning. We pray that you would meet us where we're at and whatever it is or wherever it is that we're at, Lord, help us to direct our gaze upon you and to see um, your desires for us. And so, Lord, help us to live for you and that the preaching of your word this morning would draw us close to you and would give us the insight and conviction we need um, to be encouraged and to be living for you in the week ahead. So we just pray these things all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, church family, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them up to 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> as reminded uh, by Becky, uh, as we were kind of preparing worship songs this week, <clears throat> me, Matt, and Becky were talking about it a bit, and she said, oh, well, did you know this week is actually Advent? This is the beginning of Advent. And I said, no, it's not until the first week of December, right? She's like, well, I Googled it. So, you know, I went online and Googled it too, and apparently the four weeks before Christmas are Advent. 
up until um, New Year's Eve. And so it just so happens because Christmas falls on the 25th, the four weeks before Christmas happens to be this week. So it is Advent this week. But then I, I text them back and I said, well, look, we got one more message in 2 Corinthians, so I got to finish. Like, I can't just move on without the last four verses or a couple of verses uh, that are taught. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians just to end our series in 2 Corinthians this morning. And then next week we will begin. But, you know, Advent has started. And it reminds us, of course, <clears throat> the coming of Christ. That when Jesus came into this world, everything changed. Now, God had been working, God was blessing, and God was, was maintaining and sustaining his people even before Christ came. But what we mean when we say everything changed was that when Jesus came, our ability to come into God's presence now has changed. Our sin can be forgiven for real and for good, and we can live and have eternal life. So everything changes in the moment Christ comes. And in part, that is exactly what the Apostle Paul wants the church in Corinth to realize. If you know Jesus, then everything should change. Your life should be changed. And in this final couple of verses, as he signs off and gives his farewell in, in the book itself, he's going to encourage the church in Corinth to live as if Christ is in you. To live as if you know Jesus. The title of the message this morning is The Blessing. The Apostle Paul does this numerous times in the epistles that he writes. He kind of signs off on his letters by giving a blessing to the church. It kind of says something like, and may the grace of God be with you kind of blessing. He says this numerous times in other epistles, and it's no different here in 2 Corinthians. Um, some people call this a benediction, which is the giving of a blessing. Maybe one of the most famous benedictions in the Bible comes from number 6. And you're probably familiar with this one, right? Where it says, Aaron says, to, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious, gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's one of the great benedictions of the word of God towards God's people. But in the New Testament, these smaller forms of benediction occur. Blessings. The apostles would speak to the church and give them a blessing. They would give a benediction and say, may God be with you. They would give you a blessing. So this morning, I want us to consider what this blessing is, because I believe many of us, if not all of us, we'd probably agree and say, we want God to bless us. We want to experience the blessings of God. I mean, who among us would say, no, 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 I don't want the blessing of God. Yeah, forget that. Probably virtually all of us would say, no, the blessing of God would be good. In fact, you're probably here this morning and with the busyness of life and perhaps even some of the struggles and hardships that you've been walking through, you would say, I really, really need the blessing of God. I covet the blessing of God. In fact, I don't know if I've really been experiencing it, and I, I really want to. So this morning, I hope to encourage you that God is bestowing His blessing upon you, upon us, the church. So He's giving us a blessing but in addition to that, I also want to communicate what I think the Apostle Paul communicates, which is not only is God giving a blessing, He's making you a blessing. God is making you a blessing even as He is blessing you. So the last few verses are going to communicate this idea to us. As the Apostle Paul says, be encouraged, God be with you, God bless you, He's also going to say to the church, you be a blessing yourself. So my aim this morning is that we would realize that all who bear the name of Jesus are blessed and are to be a blessing, right? If we are to bear the name of Jesus, we are going to be blessed and we are going to be a blessing to others. So let's open our Bibles there in 2 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read verses 11 through 14 this morning which say this, Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
Of course, that last verse in particular is the the formal benediction. It's the blessing. And you can kind of hear traces of that kind of classical benediction from Numbers, that the Lord bless you, that the Lord keep you. Well, the Apostle Paul formulates it or says it in a slightly different way, but it's the same idea nonetheless, that God be with you. The grace of God be with you. The love of God be with you. The fellowship of God be with you. And we're going to break that down a little bit in, in a few moments as we work through the message. But first of all, I want us to try to come to grips with what it says in the first few verses there, 11 and 12. As we're, as we're called to the church to be a blessing, and even though we may covet the blessing from God, ultimately we are called to be a blessing because God is the great blesser in our lives. So, um, a, a couple of quick um, caveats as we begin. First of all, what I am not saying and what the Bible is not saying is that you must be a blessing in order to be blessed by God. There is not some grand transaction that you are to read into the Bible. The Bible is not telling you that if you don't bless, God will never bless you. We've got to be careful about that because sometimes we can read passages or hear sermons and think, well, okay, I heard the pastor say, I just got to go out and be a blessing to people, and then the blessings of God will just roll in. Well, it's actually kind of the opposite, to be honest with you. When you realize and recognize the blessings that God has given you, the imperative then is go and be a blessing or go and do likewise. So it's not a transaction, not a spiritual transaction where you go and give of your time and efforts and money, and then God's going to turn that around and roll it back into you as a blessing in return. That's not the idea. And we really need to be careful of that too, because in our society and in our world, many, many people live life that way, not only with God, but with others as well. They think to themselves, I'm going to utilize this grand transaction. If I bless them, I'm going to expect them to bless me back. And maybe you felt it this way sometimes in your own life where, have you ever done something nice for somebody? Uh, Maybe given them a gift or or had them over for dinner. And then what do they do sometimes? They give you a thank you card. And in that thank you card, they thank you, of course, for everything. They show appreciation for what you've done. But what do you feel deep down inside, maybe, if you're anything like me, this tiny, tiny little bit of, I don't want to call it guilt, but maybe obligation. Well, should I send them a card back? I mean, well, I bless them with a meal, but then they send me a thank you card, so should I thank them for the thank you? Now, that's not wrong, of course. I'm not saying feeling that way is wrong. All I'm trying to point out is this tiny little thing, subtle as it may be in our world, where we feel obligated to reciprocate and sometimes if we're not careful, we, we impose that onto God in the economy of His kingdom, and we think, well, God's blessed me. That must mean you know, I've just, I've got to go and work for Him now. I'm His employee, and so I'm going to work for Him, and He's going to give me back. And we have this grand transaction in our, in our minds, perhaps. And subtle as it may be, we've got to be careful about it. So as we talk about the message or uh, the idea this morning about being a blessing and being blessed by God, let's keep that in mind squarely. That what we're not saying, what the Bible is not saying, is that you have to earn God's blessing. That you have to somehow give enough, and then He'll give back to you. We're not talking about it that way. So let's see how we might or should talk about it from God's Word. Well, the first thing the Apostle Paul does in verse 11, he gives a summary statement of really all of the admonishments he's given in this book already. What is an admonishment? An admonishment is a word of urgent advice. In other words, I urge you to live this way. Now, in verse 11, there's summary statements. And the reason I say that is because he doesn't go on to explain everything he means about each one of these statements. Why? Because he's already done that through the entire book. This is kind of his conclusion now. He's saying, everything you've learned in 2 Corinthians, I'm going to lay it out for you in point-by-point statement. So these are called summary admonishments, words of urgent advice to the church, summarizing everything else he's already said. So if you're going to be a blessing, if I'm going to be a blessing to others in life, live this way. 
So what does he say? Five things. Rejoice. Finally, brothers, rejoice. In some translations of God's word, that word rejoice is just translated farewell. And that's because sometimes in the ancient world, that word that was used is kind of used idiomatically, meaning it could kind of just be used as hello or goodbye. But based on the context of the word of God, I think it's best to be seen as what many translators say, the word rejoice. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Sometimes life can be busy, stressful, and painful, but the Christian is meant to remember that the Christian life is supposed to be joyful. Now, joyful doesn't mean that life is always going to be happy and pleasant, but what it does mean that whatever we walk through in life, whether it is painful hardships or blessing and abundance, we're to be joyful. He says to the church, finally, brothers, rejoice. He doesn't include any definition. He doesn't include any clause in there, like you only need to rejoice if things are going well, or only rejoice if you've just received a gift from God or somebody else. No, he's just saying blanketly, church, rejoice. Be a joyful, rejoicing church. It's one of the reasons, of course, that we sing every Sunday morning. We don't just do that as ritual. We don't just do it as tradition. We don't just do it because, well, many churches before us have done it, and the early church did it, so it's a good practice to do. It is an act of worship, and so we do it because we're worshiping God, but it's a sincere act of rejoicing. And then when we come on Sunday mornings, right, church? When we come, we rejoice together no matter what we're going through. You may be going through something that you can't bear right now, but you come on Sunday morning and you rejoice. It may be hard to get the words out. You may do it with tears streaming down your face. You may not even be able to utter the words, but in your heart, with the church, you're rejoicing. Why? Because you know, despite whatever you're going through, God is greater. Just as the kids' video showed us with the, the person Job, no matter what he was going through, and he had every reason to complain, he said, no, God bless the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he rejoices. And the church, Paul says, no matter what you're going through, rejoice. Be a rejoicing church. Secondly, he says, aim for restoration. Aim for restoration. Be a living, restored community of Christians. That's saying something for the Corinthian church, because as we well know in our study of First and Second Corinthians, the Corinthian church was a church divided. So he is very much summarizing everything he said in the last 13 chapters. Aim for restoration. And I find it so interesting that he says, aim for restoration. He's saying, this is the objective and goal. Unfortunately, because restoration is a two-way street, it's not always going to be possible. You might run into somebody who has no desire for restoration. So he says, aim for it, though. Make it a chief goal of yours as a church to be a community of restored reconciled individuals. The Apostle Paul points out for us numerous groups of people in 2 Corinthians who were divided against each other, false teachers who were trying to tear the church apart, and he calls them out, he rebukes them, and he might even go as far as to say they should leave the church. But what would be the ideal for them to repent, just as he says at the end of chapter 12, repent, return to Christ, be reconciled. So in other words, church, aim for reconciliation. Even in the worst conflicts and tensions, make that our aim. That means you need to exercise forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the chief qualities of the Christian life so that restoration can actually be achieved. And the reason I think forgiveness is such an important quality to, to talk about is because sometimes in our aiming for restoration, what we're really doing is aiming for recompense. And those two words are completely different. They both have a place in Christian life, but sometimes when we think about reconciliation or restoration, we're merely thinking about recompense. In other words, oh yeah, I'll befriend them again if they finally give back to me what they, they hurt or took from me. 
Oftentimes when we think of reconciliation, I wonder if we're not simply thinking of recompense. I will reconcile with them, but only when they prove to me that they're worthy of it. Very dangerous position to put ourselves in because it means we're putting conditions on forgiveness and we're saying to the other person, they don't ultimately deserve forgiveness. I'm going to withhold it from them until I deem them worthy. Be very careful. Aim for restoration. Recompense can be a part of that, of course, but it's not meant to be the main thing. Because as Christians, we know, did God forgive us based on us recompensing Him? Of course not. So the theme of forgiveness and restoration in the church is that we would aim for it and seek it even if we don't feel fulfilled from the other party who harmed us. So aim for restoration. Thirdly, comfort one another. Now in your Bibles, when you read that phrase, comfort one another, realize that the ancient language is not simply saying, pat one another on the back and say, there, there, it's going to be okay. That's a good thing to do, of course, when someone's hurting, but that's not the idea being expressed here, per se. What's being expressed in this statement is an encouragement. In some translations, it even says, listen to me. Not simply the phrase, comfort one another, but listen to my admonishments. So what Paul is saying is as a church family, we're to comfort one another through the encouragement of God's Word. Paul's saying the comfort you're going to receive as a church family is by listening to what I have said about the gospel in this long letter that I've written to you. So he's saying comfort one another in the Word of God. In other words, listen and obey. Find comfort in following the mission and purpose of God's Word. God's people need the Word. And see, coming beside someone when they're hurting and patting them on the back and giving them care and compassion is vitally important, yes. But the Christian ought to go a step further in comfort in the Word of God. In other words, bring a word of encouragement from God's Word. In some ways, that also means if someone's struggling or stumbling in sin, comfort them in the Word of God, saying, come back to God. It may be a word of admonishment or rebuke even, but a word that says, be convicted by God. Listen to Him. Don't keep going down the road you're going. Be comforted in knowing that God has a plan for you. He has a plan to rescue you from sin and a purpose for your life. Comfort them with the very word of God, which means convicting of truth. So rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another. Fourthly, agree with one another. This is an interesting one, isn't it? Because I don't know about you, but this kind of flies in the face of virtually everything you learn growing up. Like, you might think, wait a minute, really? Are you sure about that? Well, think about it. Agree with one another. Be agreeable, in a sense. And in a way, this kind of flies in the face of what culture tells us, be you and be self-reliant. Instead of being agreeable or malleable, be stern and strict, be in the mold that you are. And don't consider breaking out of that because if you do, that's not being yourself. Many of our young people are growing up in a world that are is actually telling them not to be agreeable in a very ironic way. In a world that's being hyper-tolerant, there's actually a very dark underlying intolerance, an idea of being unagreeable, unmovable in your position. And if anyone disagrees with you, cancel them. They're done. They're off the table. Never speak to them again. Never entertain a single thought that comes out of their mouth because they're not like you. They're against you. In a very dark way, our world is teaching our young people and our culture itself is unagreeable. It's disagreeable. It's divided. It's against one another. In many ways, what the Word of God then is saying is very radical to the hypocritical tolerance that our culture and day would preach to us. Agree with one another. In other words, set your mind on the same thing. As it relates to the church and bring it back to the spiritual application, 
This is the things of the gospel. Now, when the Bible says agree with one another, the Bible's not saying stop being you. The Bible's not saying you must stop being a distinct individual. But what the Bible is saying is in your distinction as an individual, be united with the church family. Set your mind in your distinctiveness. Set your mind on the gospel. And and the way that works itself out then, the, the church itself is meant to find unity even in their diversity through the gospel. Meaning, no matter who you are, what background you have, or skills or talents God's blessed you with, you are to set your mind, that is, set your talents, set your worship, set your livelihood on the mission of the gospel. And one thing that the church ought to be able to agree on is the foundation of the gospel, right? So that you know, all of us, no matter who we are, we can come together and say, no, the proclamation of the Word of God is fundamental. So no matter who I am, I'm going to value that and set my mind on that. I might be a nurse. I might be a business person. I might be an accountant. I might be a farmer. No matter what God has called me to do, the mission of the gospel is still paramount in my life. So as a church, we all come together with our minds set on that thing. And yes, we remain distinct. In fact, it's vitally important that we remain distinct. Because Paul says in Romans and 1 Corinthians, if, if we're all the same, then how would the gospel mission get accomplished? If everyone was a foot, where would the hand be? If everyone was an eye, where would the mouth be, right? And giving the illustration of the body parts. So distinction is necessary in the church. But Paul reminds us that so too is unity. Don't stop being distinct, but set your minds on the same thing. That is the work and worship, the work of Christ and the worship of Christ. Fifthly, he says, live in peace. This one, I'll I'll readily admit, especially when I look out in the world, live in peace. Is that even possible? It's a wonderful, trite, pithy platitude for a Christian to just speak of, go around maybe just talking about, writing papers on, theological treaties, sermons. But can I actually live in peace? Can I expect my world to live in peace? Probably not. But can I expect the church to live in peace? That's a, that's a question the Apostle Paul says, yes. In the affirmative, the church should live in peace. Now, what do we mean by that? See, with every one of these, because they're summary statements, they all have certain caveats and distinctions and limitations to them. We can't simply say that the church is supposed to live in peace and turn a blind eye to sin. Like, that's clearly not what the, what the Bible's saying, right? We, we must say, like, if somebody invades your house and seeks to harm you and your family, just roll over and die? Is that what the Bible's saying? Well, I I don't think so either. So, as with every summary statement, there are caveats. There are definitions that need to be understood. And one of the things we need to remember about Paul's encouragement to the church of live in peace is he is in no way saying that we are just going to turn a blind eye to sin and discord and division in the church. If those uh, uh, harmful people or harmful uh, ideas exist in the church, we ought to confront them. And and we ought to handle them with grace and and humility and gentleness. But live in peace. What does that mean? Caveats aside, limitations aside, what does that mean for us, church? Well, it means this. The imagery that's being given here, of course, is warlike imagery. Instead of being at war, be at peace. So what the Apostle Paul is saying, church, is Christians, lay down your weapons of warfare at one another. If you have weapons pointed at other believers, lay them down. Can you be distinct in your belief? Certainly. Will there be differences of opinion between churches, denominations, even Christians in a given local church? Absolutely. And can you have meaningful discussions about those differences? Can you, can you share a meaningful conversation with someone and then go away saying, you know what, I don't agree with them. 
They're still my brother or sister in Christ, though. Can we do that? Of course we can. And what the Apostle Paul is envisioning here and what he experienced in the church in Corinth was a whole bunch of Christians with weapons aimed at each other, just waiting to take the other guy down. Groups of people, factions forming. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. Oh, no, we're the much more pious ones. We follow Jesus. And if you don't think and act the way we do, you're out of the church. See, their weapons were aimed at each other, not just merely content with winning an argument, but destroying the man behind the argument. Weapons aimed at one another's church. And so Paul is saying when he says, live in peace, again, it's not this pithy platitude that he's just trotting out in front of us. He's saying, church, lay your weapons down. You are not at war with your fellow believer. Again, Limitations and caveats aside, yes, there's going to be times when you got to confront people with the hard truth. And the Bible's full of, uh, of commands and imperatives. Stand for the truth. But when it comes to working and living and reconciling with one another, put those weapons of warfare down. You're not fighting with each other. We're not fighting here We're on the same team. So Paul summarizes the environment of the church as one of great joy, one of forgiveness, one of conviction, yet one of unity, and one of peace. These are the characteristics of what a blessed church looks like. A church that is being a blessing to others is a church that does this. If somebody step, set foot in our church, would they say, this church rejoices this church aims for restoration. This church comforts one another. This church agrees with one another. This church lives at peace with one another. Would they believe that and, and know that about us as a church? Because I can tell you something. Many, many of you, you know this. You know this because you live this. You have, you know, a vocation where your boss is an unbeliever and you have coworkers who are unbelievers and you're in that workplace day after day after day. And in that workplace, your boss does not strive for peace he does not strive to be agreeable. He does not strive for reconciliation with his employees. He, he lives perhaps even in underhanded and underminding ways. He's prideful, perhaps even manipulative. You deal with that on a daily basis. And as a Christian, you wrestle with how you're going to interact with that person, respecting and submitting to them while at the same time standing for the truth. You deal with that daily, perhaps even in your families. Maybe in some of the brokenness of family, you wrestle with that daily as well. Some infighting, brokenness, not restoration like you'd like to see. Perhaps, of course, we see it in our communities at large and obviously in the world at large. We see great division and turmoil and conflict. Big egos and prideful egos trying to get their way, fighting and grabbing and devouring one another. We deal with that on a daily basis. So think about how, what is a person going to do when they set foot in this church and they find the exact same thing here as they deal with every single day out there? They will never, never call this a church. But look at church. If we're completely different than the world and taking up the call of blessing others, when someone sets foot in this church, it's going to be like taking a breath of fresh air. It's going to be like taking a drink of living water. Because every single day they deal with conflict. Every single day you deal with prideful, egotistical, manipulative people fighting and devouring to get their way. You don't want to come to church and find that. I mean, you would just as well have the day off, right? Right? instead of come here and see the same thing that you deal with day in and day out. But what if the church was a blessing? So when people came here, it was a relief and an escape. Not escapism, but an escape from the world to find the divine and heavenly spiritual things that the Apostle Paul says this ought to be characterizing the church. Now, is the church going to be perfect? Of course not. Are you going to find someone in the church who's prideful? Yeah, somewhere along the lines. Are you going to find someone perhaps who doesn't act Christ-like, who's, who's going to be selfish and harmful? Yeah, of course, because nobody's perfect, and you won't find a perfect church. That's not what we're trying to say. But is the church radically different than what 
the biting and devouring looks like out there. His summary admonishments, be a blessing. But then he goes on to talk about being a blessing in a different way as well, in another way. In verses 12 and 13, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. He's talking about this affectionate fellowship. Now, he's not literally talking about kissing per se, although culturally speaking in the ancient world, they would do that. Yeah, uh, kiss on the cheek when they met each other. But notice the, the, the important um, adjective, the, the important qualifier before it. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The distinction, of course, being that whatever fellowship occurs in the church, it's not sordid. It's not wicked. It's not manipulative. It's not selfish. It's holy. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Whatever fellowship you engage in in the church, it ought to be sincere and pure, affectionate fellowship. And what I mean by affectionate is that as a church family, we find warmth and welcoming and true, sincere integration in the lives of one another. Again, there's caveats galore. Can I be that integrated with everybody in the church? Of course not. Once you get to have more than 20 or 30 people, it's just not going to happen with every single person. But can I enjoy that with certain people? Of course. And can the overwhelming environment of the church feel and operate that way? Of course it should. So when Paul says, greet every or one another with a holy kiss, he's talking about affectionate fellowship. Not cold fellowship or not manipulative fellowship where I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'll be nice to that person so long as they're nice back to me. Holy fellowship. Affection that is holy. And so, again, when somebody sets foot in the church, do they find cold separation? Or do they find creepy engagement that is manipulative and self-serving? Or do they find fellowship that is warm, inviting, and affectionate? Again, not erotic. That's not what we're talking about here. Holy and affectionate together as one church. Sometimes, you know, our world, because it's so task-oriented, it spills over into the church sometimes too. Sometimes we can talk about church simply like it's a mission, right? Like the church is on mission, of course, and we use that terminology all the time, but we've got to remember the church isn't just on mission. We've got to be careful because if we're not, we'll begin to think that the church is just simply about getting tasks accomplished. Let's meet our next goal. Maybe we have a giving goal. Maybe we have a person, people goal. We want to see so many people in the church. Maybe we have an outreach evangelism goal. We want to reach so many people each year. Maybe we have a goal with our small groups. We want to see more small groups formed. We want to see more people attending those small groups. Sometimes the church can come across very, very task-oriented, and it's okay to have goals and objectives so long as you realize that's only one side of the coin. The Bible describes a church not only on mission, but in fellowship. And sometimes people can walk into a church and find that it's so task-oriented that they feel left in the dust, or they feel less than human if they're not as task-oriented as the pastor, or one of the leadership crew, or other people who are like, seem to have their hands in everything. Well, maybe I'm not as good a Christian as them because I'm not doing as much. I just got to be task oriented. I guess I just got to fill my life with more busyness in order to be a good Christian and to serve the kingdom of God. Well, that's not the answer, of course. So sometimes a church can be so task oriented that it forgets one of its tasks is being an affectionate, fellowshipping church. Greet each other with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. There are saints out there who want to enjoy fellowship together. And Paul says he's one of them as well for the church in Corinth. So, we strive 
to, to give of our lives and be a blessing. Because God has blessed us. Now, the church is not simply task-oriented. It is fellowship-oriented as well. And so the final question we ask is, why strive for such a life of blessing? So God's calling me as a Christian to be a person who blesses others. Blessing through the admonishments, blessing through the fellowship. Be a person who reaches out. Be a person who engages. Be a person who's able to bless others through your very life. That's very self-sacrificing. That's very self-giving. And someone might be tempted to ask, why? Why do that? That seems so much harder than doing nothing. Well, doing nothing is always easier than doing something. But why ought I actually live that way and, and be a blessing? Again, it's not so that we can earn the blessing back. So what is it? It's because God has already blessed you. Be a blessing because God has blessed you. So verse 14, the benediction of 2 Corinthians, the final blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is already with the church. So when the Apostle Paul says, may it be with you, he's not saying it isn't with you and you got to go out there and somehow find it. But what he's saying is, it's already with you and my prayer for you is that it would continue and you would continue in it. May you recognize it. May you know that God's blessing is upon you. May you know and receive the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the gospel, the faith, as we described it last week. Examine yourself. See if you're in the faith. Do you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? That God has blessed you, that He's blessed me, that He's blessed the church with grace. Something we didn't earn, something we could never earn. But our forgiveness of sins can be covered because of what Christ did for us. That's grace. I didn't earn that forgiveness, and I can never appear before God and tell Him, Ha, you owe me this forgiveness because of something I've done. No, the only thing God owes us is judgment and punishment. Of that, he spares us through the person of Jesus Christ. And the punishment and wrath of God falls upon Jesus instead of us. That is the grace of Christ. So may you experience that very saving grace of Christ. And may you be transformed daily by the knowledge of this grace. That's part of the benediction. That's part of the blessing. Your blessing is that God's grace is upon you constantly. Not just one time when you accepted Him as Savior, but He is constantly giving you grace, constantly holding your life graciously in His hands, that you would be transformed, that you would see the grace of God and realize day in and day out, I am blessed because of this grace. Secondly, the love of God towards us. He says, the grace of Jesus, but then the love of God. And many scholars and theologians believe, even though the word Father isn't used there, he's talking about the first member of the Trinity, God the Father. We see a very Trinitarian statement happening. Grace of Jesus, love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So many are led to believe that he's talking about the love of the Father specifically. So that God's love is towards us constantly as well. Now, yes, the love of God has been shown through Jesus, uh, the very sacrifice of Christ, but the love of the Father towards us constantly. Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So may God's love be ever towards you, and may you feel it and believe it. One of the reasons why the benediction is given is not to mysteriously or magically give God's blessing to you, but that the church would be aware of it. So it's repeated in the Word of God. It was repeated back in Aaron's day, and it's repeated in days like today, not so that God will magically dispense of His grace because I said some magic words. No, because your mind and heart are becoming aware of it constantly. 
So when Paul says, may it be upon you, he's saying, may you know the love of God and may you continue in the knowledge of that love day in and day out. Finally, he'll say that you would be in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God unites us in His fellowship. What an apt way to end the book, right? As he's been wrestling with people who have been so divisive in their lives, even in the church. He says, remember this great blessing, (laughs) even though you're fighting all the time, even though you've been devouring each other and you ought not to be, you are united in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The triune God himself calls you into fellowship with him and with each other. So may you know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And may you live in it day in and day out. So the blessing of God follows the Christian in life. We are a blessed people. And because we're blessed, we can be a blessing to others. Reminds me, all the way back to the beginning of God's Word in the book of Genesis, when God calls Abraham out and He's going to bless him and make him a great nation. The people of Israel would come from Abraham, ultimately, as, of course, many of us know. In the book of Genesis, God says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Why? So that you will be a blessing. All the blessing comes upon the Christian, not just so we can bask in it, although that is amazing to comprehend as well that God graciously gives us His blessing without request or without being deserved. He gives us His blessing. But He's given us His blessing so that we would be a blessing to others. This morning, maybe you're walking through some very difficult times. Maybe you feel burdened because of what you're walking through. And you might wonder, I don't really feel blessed, Pastor. I don't know, am I really blessed based on what I'm going through? Well, the Word of God wants to assure you and comfort you this morning. Yes, you are a blessed person. If you know Christ, if you're in Christ, as he says a few verses earlier, you are blessed. The grace of Jesus upon you, the love of God upon you, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, maybe, hopefully, prayerfully, this place, WCC, this church would be a place you would come and you would find that kind of God-ordained divine supernatural relief, a drink of cool water to part your lips from a harsh and cruel world that seeks to devour and divide and harm. And maybe this morning you need to remember that you are His child. And you are blessed so that you can be a blessing. Let me read you two Psalms. Psalm 46, 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though its mountains tremble at its swelling. Similarly, Psalm 118 says, Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? To be a blessing, you must realize that you are blessed. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us see this, comprehend it, understand it, and then convict us to live in it in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you for being a Father, a God who blesses us beyond comprehension, but in what we can comprehend, Father, Help us to be joyful. Help us to be grateful for all you've done. And then help us to turn that joy outward to be a blessing to others. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing in closing, The Love of God.
with saints and angels song. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace to Adam's race the saints and angels song the love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song could we with think the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the soul encourage you, if you've got time in your schedule, uh, stay with us afterwards and help decorate for Christmas. But if not, we'll have a great week ahead again, and God bless. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, again, we want to thank you for your great blessing towards us and the grace that you've given through Christ. May it be in our minds and hearts as we go into uh, our week ahead and into the world around us. Father, we might be under pressure and we might be burdened by many things. Help us, Lord, though, to live different than those around us, to be a blessing to others because of what you've done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.